I'm going to just start off uh, right from the beginning briefly and then work my way around the whole fire center, give, uh, give you a, a briefing on all the fires, and then I'm going to turn it over to Reg and we can talk the specifics on the North Plateau fire for you folks. So uh, back uh, when this all started, as you all know, uh, the entire fire center was under uh, severe drought conditions. So when that lightning hit, uh, we had a multitude of fires uh, all start at the same time. And to be quite honest, it, it was incredibly overwhelming uh, for, for all of us, uh, for residents, for the public, and for the responders. It was, uh, I can't even begin to explain what that was like that first week and a half. Um, you know, we do. I do. I do also want to thank, thank all of the uh, locals, uh, industry people, uh, everybody that went out of their way, especially in the first two weeks, uh, to help us respond to the fires. Um, so uh, I want to just put that out there. Um, when that all happened, because uh, we were in such drought conditions, uh, we had a lot of fires that very, very quickly. Uh, got out of control. Uh, the, the fire growth, um, you know, because of the winds and everything that we're experienced was extraordinary. And what made it even more challenging is that these fires uh, occurred uh, around where people were living, around Williams Lake, uh, ranchers, yourselves, uh, and so that always makes it incredibly challenging. Um, so to mobilize, things it takes time uh, so to fast forward uh, currently in the fire center have approximately uh, 1550 uh, firefighters approximately 160 pieces of equipment and 50 or so uh, helicopters and of course we've been utilizing air tankers uh, as such uh, as we can one of the things that's made uh, uh, that's really hampered our, our efforts uh, not only were the conditions uh, and how volatile things were, but also the smoke. Uh, for that first three weeks and the first month, uh, we really didn't even know how big some of these fires were because we weren't able to get up in the air and actually assess them. So that, that really makes it uh, even more challenging. Um, uh, one, there was a couple of major uh, events that happened. And one in particular was August 11th and August 12th. Uh, and what happened was we had a multitude of fires across the landscape and then a cold front passage came through. And so there was two, a weaker one on the Friday, August 11th, uh, which started to heat, really heat things up. And it, the fires really burned really aggressively throughout the evening. Uh, and on Saturday, uh, on August 12th, the other cold front came through and we had sustained winds all day and into the next night, um, averaging 35 to 40 kilometer gusts and, and even greater because there was also some thunder cells associated and in some places, especially up in that northern part, the Nashville lightning and gusts reported up to 50. What all that means or what all that meant is that that was evidenced by the fire growth was uh, incredible what happened was all of the larger fires and all of the smaller fires in that whole area, there's a total of about 19 fires, uh, five or six of which were fairly significant size and the rest were smaller. Uh, they all joined. And um, you know now we're sitting uh, with the Plateau Fire at just under 500,000 uh, hectares. Phenomenal growth. Uh, I, I don't know how you can explain it any further. So. Um, anyways, just uh, I'll go around the fire center. I'll start out in the Quenelle Lakes area. Uh, we had a multitude of fires out there. Uh, that industry has been working for us and continue to work for us. Uh, that whole area has received, uh, you know, a lot more rain than on this side. And uh, all of those fires are, are looking really good. Uh, they're all in mop up and uh, quite, a, quite a few of them are off the books. They're done. So, so that area is looking uh, really good. Down south at uh, the Gustafson Fire, uh, the first one, uh, that's been in mop up patrol for a long time. There, we don't expect any issues uh, out of there. Uh, down in the south, the Hansville Fire, that fire continues to be a challenge for us. Um, in one area in the south there, it's gotten into Farewell Canyon. And um, 
it's just it's just a difficult piece of ground to work. Uh, we can't use equipment in there, so it's basically direct attack in there. Um, the rest of the fire is looking really good, uh, and, and we're optimistic, and they've been making really good headway on that uh, for the last couple of weeks. Out west, uh, the Clean and Clean Coldwell Fire and Precipice Fire, um, they did not grow as much as uh, some of the other ones, but having said that, there was significant growth that did threaten the highway in those communities out there for a short time. Um, once again, really good progress uh, there, and uh, we're really happy with what's going on out there right now. Uh, moving to the Plateau Fire uh, South, um, the fire actually, uh, the old Cheswick fire, the ranches that, are, that were there, that fire really hasn't moved to the south uh, too much this whole time. Uh, there was a combination of uh, natural breaks and roads that the fire burned back to, and we were able to hold it and extend those roads. We were kind of able to hold it in that same area. On the uh, uh, east uh, side of the uh, South Plateau fire, you notice that that fire, when you look on the map, really just took off uh, on the western half and, and did a significant run to the north. The reason for that is because when we when we address a fire, we always look at, at uh, you know the values at risk, and and of course, public and private property are are our number one concern, along with responder safety. So when we deploy our crews, we uh, we deployed them on that side, and we only had the one crew, and they did a bunch of burning there, um, and that side held. Unfortunately, um, because of the lack of resources, uh, we weren't able to get to the other side, and um, I'm not sure if it would have made too much of a difference because there is simply a lot of fire in there, and it did make a significant run uh, to the north. Uh, it hasn't moved uh, to the uh, uh, west, any more than uh, it had uh, since that run. And uh, we continue to make really good progress on that south part of the Plateau Fire. Uh, the north, I won't get into in too much detail. I'll leave that up to Reg. Thanks, Tony. Reg, you want to join us? Yeah, I'll just uh, Tony and uh, uh, thanks for all you folks for coming out. And I know uh, the last several weeks have been difficult on uh, a lot of people in this room. And uh, I would just like to thank uh, most of the folks that are sitting at this table, uh, uh, the RCMP that are sitting out here, um, all of these folks in the background have, uh, have supported uh, uh, the Wildfire Service uh, in the efforts that uh, uh, that we've been doing over the last several weeks, so uh, thank you everybody there. Uh, now getting to uh, the Plateau Fire. Our portion of uh, the Plateau Fire in the north is approximately uh, uh, 221,000 hectares, which is, uh, is a daunting task when you uh, look at it. Uh, the folks that we have on here right now got about 225 personnel. We're looking at 51 pieces of equipment and uh, 12 helicopters. And uh, on a normal year, if this was the only incident, uh, these, re these resources would be a lot higher. So what we've done is we've, we've decided that uh, life and property and safety of responders is our main goals. So we looked at the fire, looked at where those folks are, and that's where we uh, put the majority of our resources. So uh, we've got the Kluskis, we've got the Bad Muni Thai Town, and um, uh, sorry, uh, and the Nazca area. So those are the areas that we've put all of our resources on. We don't have anybody. Uh, on the west flank going down there. There's there's no folks out that way. So that's where we put our resources. So uh, I'll just kind of start off in the west. Um, over in the Kluskis, uh, 
where the IR reserve is over there, and those folks, uh, we were able to uh, establish guards uh, on the Kluskis Lake, uh, from the Kluskis Lake running north. Um, that's a very sensitive area with arc values, so we've had folks go in there and uh, we put in control lines all by hand, no machine work in there. It was about three kilometers, so uh, the folks there did a lot of work on the ground and we're, we're kind of waiting for the fire to come down to our control lines off the hill there. On the other side, we were able to uh, use equipment from the Kluskis to the 4000 road. So we've, uh, we've got machine guards in there. Uh, we've had people in there for several days and that portion of the fire is looking really good and uh, very few smokes in there. We were able to save all the infrastructure as far as the communication tower there and uh, most of the power and that sort of stuff. So uh, big success there. We are working a little further uh, down that uh, uh, down that flank on the uh, west side down to Bishop Creek and uh, that's continuing as we speak and we hope to be tied into there uh, over the next day and uh, we feel once we, we get to that point that uh, we'll have some pretty good control and we'll feel a lot better about that particular area of our fire. Now as we move north, uh, we have the Bat and, uh, and, and Thai Town there. Uh, we have our, our main fire, the North Plateau fire, but there's also uh, another little fire above that, only about 19,000 hectares. Uh, that fire, uh, again, uh, looking at the transportation corridor and where the people are there, uh, our main focus was to start in the north and work our way down that east flank to make sure that we're protecting those communities. Uh, we've got our guard completely uh, uh, from the north around uh, Sweet Creek all the way down that, uh, that east flank. And uh, in addition to that, a uh, few, uh, few kilometers over, there was a road system that runs kind of parallel to that fire and we've opened that up as a contingency guard. So, we're, we're feeling uh, pretty confident in that area. Um, now moving down into the Kluskis, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, into the NASCO where versus a lot of them are sitting there. We've, we've got most of our iron, most of our helicopters, and most of our people have been working that stretch of the fire uh, um, and of course the previous team as well. But, We've been uh, in there for a solid uh, two weeks with most of our equipment in there. And uh, over the last several days, uh, we're starting to tie pieces together there. Uh, we're starting to feel really good. We haven't seen a lot of fire activity over the last 10 to 12 days. And uh, that has allowed us to, uh, to really get in there with our resources and uh, make some really good progress. And I, my team has almost finished their stint, uh, but I'm really hoping the next team that comes in that they will be able to deliver some really good news uh, in fairly short order, especially if we have a little bit more help with the weather. Um, I, think, uh, I think things will be looking really good for the folks there, but uh, we're still not out of the woods yet. Um, we do have uh, some warmer weather coming for a few days, and. Uh, possibly some winds, so uh, we're preparing for that. And, uh, the crews are ready and uh, we're going to do our best to keep everything uh, in the box and continue our progress. Uh, as slow as it may seem to you folks, uh, it is happening and uh, day by day uh, we're tightening up the box on that fire. So um, that's about all I've got for you folks tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Reg. Uh, I think Gord also has a bit of a, an update for us in terms of structure protection, is that right? And then uh, we'll open it up for questions for all three of them. Thank you, good evening. Uh, I didn't really cover the presentation, but I did want to talk a little bit about what structure protection is all about. And uh, uh, First of all, 
I'm from the office of fire commissioner, and uh, generally we're called out by welfare management whenever there is a fire that uh, is potentially threatening the community. And I guess structure protection may not be the, uh, the true word, it's more of a values protection. And that uh, uh, we also protect heritage sites, we protect infrastructure, we protect uh, you know bridges and things like that that are important, also important to the community as well. And, uh, so that's one of our jobs. And, and one of my jobs, or my job per se, is, uh, is to uh, organize and manage the structure protection units. And again, working very closely with wildfire management uh, and utilizing a lot of wildfire management personnel as well. Uh, you've probably heard about the sprinklers. So we come with sprinkler protection units. And that's one of the, uh, the tools, sort of in our toolbox, that we use to, uh, to provide protection to, to the values. Uh, we're also known to, uh, to look after uh, things like fire engines, uh, fire departments. We help to organize them in, in their response to uh, interface fires as well. So, uh, busy year this year for sure. We've all uh, been out on numerous fires and uh, certainly uh, the ones you have here are, uh, are certainly very challenging and taking up a lot of resources. And uh, We've certainly been challenged with some of the geographic areas uh, that have to be covered. But, uh, we're certainly working our way through it, and uh, we're going to continue to, uh, to push forward and, uh, and protect the values that we can and, uh, and make sure that uh, uh, we have a successful outcome. So I really look forward to uh, answering any of your questions you have around structure and value protection. And, uh, we'll Thanks, Mike. All right, so any questions for uh, any of these guys up here? <coughs> yes. Question for the person. The, the, uh, uh, you have uh, some equipment at our ranch near to Harvey Lake. It's about 4,000 feet, and it's starting to freeze at night. Do they, do your pumps need to be drained, or are they drained when they leave them, or what happens there? Should I drain some water out of there for you? That one certainly is a challenge. Uh, we start to uh, get into these conditions and get into freezing conditions. No, the pumps aren't generally drained. We, we leave them as primed as possible with water, similar to hose lines and things like that, so that should we need them, that we, we fire them up and, and everything charged up really quick. But it, it's a great uh, great question, and, uh, and really the, the pump casing should be drained if possible to uh, to make sure that the, the pump casing itself doesn't freeze and make the pump inoperable. And would you like us to do that for you? We certainly appreciate that, and uh, we certainly appreciate the help that, uh, that everybody puts in. Any other questions? Yes. Um, and, uh, Jeff, I'm going to ask you about the fire Yes, the focus is on the primary buildings, the primary residential structures. And based on, uh, on resources, uh, we do like to protect outbuildings. And on occasion, depending on how close the outbuilding is to the main structure, it can be a hazard and a problem and the fire. We want to make sure that the fire doesn't transmit from these buildings. But they are secondary buildings for the most part. Uh, and uh, you know, based on time, based on resources, uh, we will do it. And occasionally, we might not have that resources. For those of us that are quite well inside the fire perimeter, is there any likelihood of that ever uh, the evacuation order or being rescinded before snow comes? And assume that we're, we're living on purpose uh, until that time. Um, yes, um, we 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 look at that every day, and, and it's a it's a heavy weight. We we understand that everybody's been out for for quite some time very frustrating but it, we do have to make sure that when, when with absolute certainty or as much certainty as we can when we res recommend to rescind that everything is lined up that we do that we have done as much as possible and one of the things that, that drives that decision well there's a few things right? it's, it's the weather and the weather forecast what's coming at us what kind of fire behavior can we expect and that always drives our decision. And it's not just the next day. We also have to look out almost a week. And, and you know, I, I, as been evidence uh, on these fires before, I mean, at one point, they all took a little bit of rain, and it got cloudy, and the humidity went up. But then after a few days of warm weather, and then followed with a significant wind, 
So those are the kind of things, you know, that we consider. And uh, I tell you, we do talk about it every day. Yes. Let me comment uh, on that question. Uh, first of all, you, uh, you guys know that uh, you've excluded a large portion of the community by having us being here. Uh, there are people that are held captive inside the fire zone and are not allowed to move in and out. So they have asked us to take notes because they cannot be here to represent themselves. And I think that's a, a major issue for people to be able to move back and forth between their properties and be able to come home. People live in those areas because there are self-sufficient, independent people. Now, what you've really created is a real nanny state where we have to, you're asking us to rely on mom and dad to make decisions for us. And that's pretty insulting. So I think if, if there's significant hazard, people are going to go to turn their vehicles around. If they want to drive in, let them cook. If they want to stay there, that's a decision that you make. So this whole uh, evacuation order is fine. And people are allowed to stay, but they're not allowed to go back and forth. It's ridiculous. It's lasted for a month, and people are stuck in there. They can't get groceries. So I'll advocate for those people. So. Do you have a specific question? Yeah, so, my question so my question is, Who's in charge of starting fires? Who makes that call? It's a combined decision. Uh, the incident commander uh, is in charge of the entire incident and in conversation with our structure protection folks and, and his operations chief, that's who makes the decision. The IC. Who decides not to start fires? Well, when the decision is made, to start the pumps once again, it's uh, it's based on what is happening at the fire and how we expect. We start looking at that. We, we you know our weather forecasters are looking at that weather and how that cold front is coming down, and then we also look at what the fire is doing and, and its behavior. Once things start to pick up, and uh, you know, and it's obvious that you know it's going to make a run, and and it has that potential to uh, impact the value, then the pumps are starting. And we also have to do it with enough time to get our folks in there safely and then and then so they can get out. So well, any other question? Yeah, so we have a neighbor who uh, I know the structural protection unit was at their place. They were excluded from going to their place because of the evacuation order. They don't live inside the inside the uh, evacuation area. The structure was they were I know that the structural protection people had taken pictures of their place and they were promised that they would have sprinklers put on their place. It wasn't done and the place is gone. So who made that decision? I'm not sure on the details on that. Um, what we can do is uh, we can uh, talk to you afterward and uh, find out those details for you, sir. There was a question at the back there. Yeah, um, when are we going to get an update of that? This map is not very recent. This is the same map we've had for almost the last week. Uh, I know I live in Aspen when I'm there. I know, that, I know the fire is a lot closer in certain areas than on the map. I mean, it's great to get information, but if the information is two or three days old, the fire, that's, that's pretty old. So your question just is for everyone here is just when, when you'll get a new and updated map? Yeah, that's my question. The next question is, I'm a guy out here and I've been talking to the regional manager about when, about when, what they think they're going to do in uh, North or West of Nassau as far as opening, being able to open the road. Because I have to go through that fire because of the area that's not under evacuation in order to run a business as well. He says that that area could be closed up until November 30th. Well, that pretty much sinks it. If, uh, if I'm not able to be able to do that 3900 to get them back here, they might seem selfish, but I feel still do have to run a business if I need to survive uh, you know, financially. 
So your question is just when the 3900 road might might open up? That would be a uh, car, yeah. Okay. And it's under uh, order right now, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. And as Tony alluded to, uh, there's a couple of issues there on that road. Uh, one, um, it is under order. And uh, like Tony said, we, we're going to evaluate that uh, on a continual basis. The other issue on that particular road is there's stretches on that road that have been burnt. Uh, quite severely. So um, we go through because it's our workspace and make sure that the trees uh, that we identify uh, are taken down. But as a public road or a road, uh, um, an industry road that's going to be used, that's going to have to be looked at quite a bit more and quite a few more trees taken down in there. Or the next wind that comes. That, uh, that road's going to be loaded up and it's dangerous for the uh, for industry. They're going to have to look at it before they, they move through there um, and yourself. So th there's a few things that have got to get done there. The first thing is uh, the order's going to be lifted. And, and, and like, like we said, uh, you know, none of those, we don't take those things lightly. I don't want to put anybody uh, or have them out of their homes. That is the last thing I want to do. But at the end of the day, as an incident commander on that area, every person that is in that area is my responsibility, regardless if they want it or not. I'm responsible for all of those people. So uh, every decision I make uh, has safety first. And as soon as it's safe to do so, the minute it is safe to do so, I would recommend uh, those uh, orders being uh, downgraded to alerts or to be taken off completely. But uh, I'm not satisfied those conditions are met yet. I understand safety safety comes first, but then, and I relate that to the regional matter, of course, safety comes first. But then it went on to allude that if the evacuation order is lifted and the office is done, that we still would be able to go to those areas because the concern is that our business might hinder the, the movability of, of crews throughout the area and that we might be in the way. Now, let's uh, just clarify that. So, once the order is rescinded, um, it'll be under alert. And, and however, what we've done is we've put uh, a, an area restriction over it so we can control the work site. If, if you have business that you need to go through that area, we, we will look at that case by case and issue a pass. So who do, we, who do I talk to in order to be up to date on, on being able to move through that area? To, uh, to okay, you can afterwards, I'll give you a number uh, for our information folks and you can phone them and you, they can keep you updated day by day. I think there was a question at the back here. What's the requirement that you want to continue? Right. Sorry, can you, I didn't quite catch that. Can you say it again? What's the requirement percentage that you want to continue for people to be entered? So the question is, what's the requirement for the percentage of containment before they'll let people back in? Yes. Okay. On, uh, on a fire this large, it's not it's not so much uh, what the containment is. It's really looking at the, the entire fire as a whole. And once uh, we deem that's, you know, uh, there's acceptable risk there and the order is lifted, um, then folks will be able to go back. But it, it, it's hard to say, is it 15% containment? Is it 30% containment? You know, containment's what you've got on the outside where the fire is going to leave, uh, you know, where we've guarded, where we've worked and, and gone on. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't speak to the interior of the fire. It just speaks to the 
inside edge. So if if you uh, say live in uh, in the NASCO, once we have that flank uh, dealt with, then and, and we feel that we we've got that piece contained, and we feel comfortable that the fire's not going to come out around the top or uh, come out around the bottom. Um, then we would uh, seriously be looking at downgrading the order to an order. But, uh, you know, if, if, if it was just a percentage, well, we're not working uh, the whole west side. So that that's not going to be contained anytime soon. So it's more that specific area uh, that's adjacent to those communities. Yeah, thank you. I think there's a question here. Yeah, I want to stay in line. Uh, looking at the Nazco Valley uh, itself, the fire looks like the fire line is uh, west of the, the valley. And it looks like it's under the two to four kilometers away. And I understand that you have anchors and crews and uh, equipment working on the line to secure it. Um, how would the line be secured enough to allow people to recur? I know you guys have had over a week now, and it's been pretty intense. Um, and assuming that the fire doesn't jump in the wind, are we getting close to adding that security point in order to move So just maybe I'll clarify for someone looking here. Your question is just that uh, how how long or how close is it to, to that flank by NASCO being secured to, to let people back in? Is kind of the gist of it? How much, how much of that have you got tied up now? Okay, how much is tied up right now? Well, you know, in that area, it's it, it you know, it's really hard to say how much we we have tied up, so to speak. We've got crews in in several different areas that are moving towards each other, but we've got both direct and indirect lines there. Um, so the direct lines are essentially when we're 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 right up against the fire when we're putting that piece up. Um, there's other areas in there that uh, that fire is on the slope and it's coming down down to a control line. So you've got the fire is still you know several hundred meters away from your control line, and uh, in those areas we had burns proposed. So we had our control line at the bottom where we could actually get at a fire if it was there. Uh, and then the fire sitting on a mid slope where we can't get machinery or equipment in there. And we don't want to stick people up, up on the slope. So, you know, those are the areas that you hear when we're burning off from our, burning off from our control lights. We're waiting for the, the proper conditions to do that burn. Then we can, from our control light, we can put that 50 feet, 100 feet inside the blackout, you know, and then we feel secure. We aren't there yet, um, so it's, it, those lines aren't what I would call contained because you've got you've got green fuel between the black and your control line. Uh, other areas that that we are working directly on, uh, again, these things uh, we like I've said we've had most of our, our folks in there doing the work in the in that NASCO area and. It is a it is a slow pro progress in there. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but uh, you know, I, I I really hope that over the next couple of weeks that that we would we would have some good news for you. But it really depends on a lot of factors that I so I, I can't give you a real good date, but uh, it, it is something that we we talk about at night in our ops meeting, uh, the desire to get uh, those pieces of ground completed and get the folks back in. Uh, it's something that we're working hard to do. So. All right, one more question, uh, maybe then we'll uh, leave any other questions as we move forward and then we'll come back to the wildfire questions again at the end. Yes. Um, the fire guards that you are currently working on, are, are they, uh, 
So the question is just the, the guards they're working on, they have fuel along them or are they buried in dirt? No. So uh, the way that uh, we've been typically doing it on this wire, and by the way, we've got over uh, 650 kilometers of guard. Uh, what we're typically doing in most of these areas is uh, fill the punctures or excavators will go first and push the wood over. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, with the fellow budget will cut it, lay it down. Cats will come uh, uh, through and put the guard in. And we have been skidding all of that wood to centralized locations. So uh, officials at the district office can come out, uh, inventory that wood, and then it will be assigned to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to either logging companies or BCTS or individual contractors. So that wood will eventually uh, make its way to the mill. Um, so, so the wood is being logged is what you're saying? No, no. We're full tree skating to a central location. You, if you can imagine, the last thing you want to do is put a guard in and then have a mountain of fuel right beside the guard. If I have a mountain of fuel, only one mistake, the fire comes, it touches that, and all of a sudden, you've got, you've got 10 kilometers of uh, fuel. So why is it laying exactly as you described, all up and down the 4100? 4100 looks exactly like that. 4100 looks exactly like that, and the fires have burned right through the fire guard have lit your log piles that are sitting leaning up against trees on the other side of the road. Right, and, and you know, uh, when these wind events come, I mean, you so don't, you don't, and let's just let him answer the question. Thanks, you guys, you asked your question, let's let him answer.
Uh, you've given us a report which we really appreciate, by the way, and we really appreciate the structural stuff that you've already done. But this is what your report says to me today. The crews have been working hard in the high combat duty, uh, and their work has been reduced, has reduced the risk from the fire to homes and structures that we move today as it's no longer needed and will be used elsewhere. That's news to me as of tonight. You've told us a whole bunch about kind of fire protection. We appreciate that information, but I'm, I'm getting a little confused. Is, is there something you know about the Tycon area that we don't know? And is my home and other homes now going to have the structural protection that was there yesterday removed? Is, is that what's happening? And they're still leaving the order on? So this, this doesn't make sense to me at the moment. Rich, can you help out? Yeah, I can. So, uh, like I said, uh, we, we've completed the garden around uh, that uh, 970 fire, and we've got uh, the contingency guarding uh, that's completed. And uh, we're working uh, uh, with the CRD right now to uh, look at uh, changing uh, some of the uh, alerts and orders in that area, but it's going to be taken a little bit of time, but we, we might hear something uh, fairly quickly. You didn't answer his question. Uh, the sprinkler, the sprinkler, usually before we, uh, we have people go back into an area, we remove uh, a lot of the, the pumps and holes before they get back in there. All right, I think we'll, I think we'll have to keep going in the same time. We're, we're already 50 minutes in, so just for the sake of time, we also have uh, the BC Welfare Service and the Fire Information Officer will be available to continue to answer any questions you might have, so um, don't feel like your questions can't be answered tonight. So um, we can also come back to that again at the end if we need to. So um, next up, we have uh, some of our elected officials, and uh, we'll allow them to speak. Then at the end, you can ask your questions of them. So first up, uh, MLA folks, if you wanted to come up and say a few words. Thanks, Emily. Um, I would like to recognize that we are on the traditional territory of the Lataco First Nations and the Southern Cal Nation Alliance. Thank you for coming tonight. And I think I see Councillor Shantyman uh, in the back. Uh, thank you very much. You've been fantastic representative in NASCO and making sure your community is up to date. And Neil, thank you for the work that you're doing with Kuz Kuz Um Thank you for coming tonight, for all of you, um, to all the elected officials and all of our colleagues. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe I'm just going to share a little bit about how I'm feeling right now. And, you know, we're on, we're on two months of this. And when the lightning hit on July 7th, um, it will be an event that, for all of us, uh, is something that is going to take us a long time to recover from. Um, over the last few weeks, we have been in multiple communities. I spent Sunday in Miocene and Spoken Lake, and yesterday we were in Wildwood. Um, we've been out to Big Lake, and we're heading to Tidy Lake, and we're going to Soda Creek, and, and i got to tell you, it's absolutely overwhelming. Um, there isn't a day that I don't wake up and think, holy cow, how are we going to get through this? Um, it's, it's pretty daunting. And so I remind myself um, in those days some of the stories that I heard as we visited communities. And um, I think in times like this, it's, it's important for us to really remember some of the things that we've heard in each of these communities and how each of the communities are doing. Um, I'm a big animal lover, and I have to tell you the work that the Pet Safe Coalition did here in Alice Fraser Park um, and continue to do, I think, is uh, significantly important. And, you know, I think of the work and the hours that they put in. I've never seen I've never seen a site like on July, I think it was the 11th, when the caravan came in and you had everyone that you knew with stock trailers going into Alex Fraser Park to make sure that we could go out and get as many animals as possible. And I think, you know, that's just what we do. 
Um, and I think of our EOC team who's here and the EOC team from uh, our, the supporters. My goodness, we're on day, I don't even know how many days we're in, but you guys have showed up and you know, I would stop in here and I just gotta tell you the love um, and compassion that was shared um, every day was uh, something that makes us all proud. And I visited Prince George. You know, we had communities that have been out a month and a half, but not that any of you want to hear that. Um, but, you know, the fact that Prince George welcomed all of these volunteers, or the volunteers welcomed, you know, people in um, was pretty, uh, pretty extraordinary. And so, I guess at times like this, and it is difficult times, and we have tremendous work ahead of us. We do have to kind of reflect on, on the people that have stepped up and have done amazing things. And I'll say something else about the, the wildfire service, and I think sometimes it's forgotten, is so many of the men and women who are fighting these fires are from our area. And, you know, I would, we so appreciate all the teams that have, have come in and, and helped us from not just uh, BC, but from around the globe. It has been extraordinary. But I stop down to the Cornell office every couple of days just to show some encouraging, um, encouragement because you know it's demoralizing. It's hard. It's hard to see you know our force that we all passionately love and care about um, in a situation like this. It's unprecedented. And so I just remind all of us that um, we're all in this together, and we all passionately love our community and. Um, and our RCMP and our military who stepped up uh, and kept our community safe. Thank you very much. So next step, big provincial picture. Um, Stuart, you're absolutely right. We've got to be looking at economic recovery for a region and whether it's the ranchers or whether it's the trappers, whether it's the guide and outfitters, um, we have to stand strong in the caribou and we have to send a very significant message to Victoria that the investments um, as we look at recovery need to be made here. For years, so much of our money has gone down there. It's time that when, in times like this, that it comes back. And so the MLAs and the Caribou, we, we are connecting every day. Um, we're writing letters, we're doing our absolute best, and most days it, it doesn't seem like a fraction of enough. It seems like it's really difficult to move a really big cog in a wheel, but we're trying and we're going to continue to work on your behalf because we know how important that is and to our First Nations community, making sure that you have the support is, is critically um, important. And the final one is the other thing is MLAs we do every day is we make sure that Victoria doesn't forget that you need to be putting the resources in our communities. We may not have the population, we may not have, you know, the structures, but we have huge hearts and you need to be investing in the resources to make sure that our communities are protected, that our economies are protected. So we're going to continue to fight. Unfortunately, we head back to, well, I should, we head back to Victoria. Um, we start next week. We're heading back down and it breaks my heart because I'd much rather be here in the communities, but we know we have big work to do down to make sure Victoria understands what's happening here. Um, and we'll be fighting like mad and we'll be loud because that's what we can do in the caribou. So um, contact our office. We can make sure we continue the pressure on letters. And I just want to thank all of you for, for coming out tonight and for all your, your support of your communities. Exactly. Next, we have a CRD chair. Apologies to what's happened to you again. I don't think any community deserves to have it happen. What's happened again? And Thai Town folks in 2010 as well. I remember that very well. So um, I did want to sort of paint a picture, and I know that it's your home, and, and when it's your home, it's uh, it's very hard to be uh, to back up. But I encourage you to look at the maps and look at the largest fire, the plateau fire, the largest fire in British Columbia history, the worst fire season in 60 years. Um, and the folks who are here answering your hard questions, and you have a right to ask hard questions. Um, but you also have to recognize that, as I said, many of the people who work in the fire center and fire fires here are in our communities. Um, many of the ones I know, Williams Lake and Fire Center, um, their kids went to school with my kids. 
and this has taken a toll on these folks. Um, the disappointments, the, uh, the failures, the, the setbacks. Um, the evacuation the night of the conference call when they had to be evacuated from their own fire center. Fire was coming, they told me to get up, we had to suspend the conference call, but some stayed behind because they had to keep communications going. I think really everybody, despite our angst and their concern, uh, needs to recognize that these folks need a warm round of applause for the work they've done. They could have done a great job in very, very trying times. So I think they deserve some acknowledgement for some of So as, as Reg and Tony indicated, um, <clears throat> our goal, of course, is always safety. So we started off with that with 35,000 people have been impacted by these fires. We have evacuated over 25,000 people. Everybody's safe, we've had no loss of life. We've had some seniors compromised, and so we probably had two deaths as a result of impacts of fire because of their effect on their health. But just because of more, probably most emotional, they not be able to adapt to new locations. But as a result of the evacuations, you folks have done a great job of getting yourselves unsafe. And that uh, as a testament to the RCMP and search and rescue, and the fire people who gave us enough warning that you weren't faced with, they were faced with in Fort McMurray where the fire was on their tails as you're coming out of the community. Because you wait too long, it's just too dangerous to get people out. So, um, so far we know we've lost 54 homes and we have 136 of buildings. We're trying to get the figure, the world update figures by region, but they're difficult to get. And I was checking my phone not to be rude, but to try and see if I had the information for it now. I haven't got it yet. Um, but I can tell you that uh, the other today we were successful in getting about another 54 people home. So we've gone from about 909 people down to about 100, 850 people and now still other homes. And of course you, you folks are impacted by that. To register to Tony's point, this is the sheet we started off with this morning. We had seven areas we want to look at to see if we get people home. It's done every morning. It's done again in the afternoon. The goal is to get the roads open, get the people home, and keep them safe. We hope to get three or four today. We got two, and we had a setback on one, and they said, no, it's too dangerous to go in, and that changed overnight. So we do do that. We have a sheet. Every morning, the EOC director goes and says, who can we get them home? How can we get them home? If you're allowed to go home by work, um, I'll give you some examples because we got a number of people go home. Everybody's comfort level with fire is different. Um, in my community, I was in that grade from my home for some 20 days and then I moved my family to my cabin and lo and behold, I signed another order to get us out of the cabin because it wasn't safe, so we moved to the cabin. So I've been affected. I haven't lost my home, but it was affected had the problem with freezers and had to throw food out and all the things that you'll experience when you go home and go see the Red Cross. They got some good handouts and some good information on how you can go back to your home safely and what you need to look at. But if you do go home and you go back on the work, you've got to remember to be diligent. In my community, uh, we had people go home. And a lady phoned me up who was on the relentlessly go home. And when she got home within two days, she phoned and said, why did you let me come home? Because it's not safe. Because they had hot spots and fire spread up and the fire department's back and the forestry's back. So that fine line that people like Reg make is to keep you safe. But you're not going to go back to community the same as you left if the fire went through. You're going to have hot spots. And those hot spots are going to be there for a long time. So have it both ends. Let me go back too soon. You don't let me go back. We can't really win no matter what we do. Some people want to stay out, other people don't. Our goal, as soon as it's safe, these folks stay safe, we want you to go home, and we want you to be safe. And mostly because if we have to ask you to leave again, we want you to know, we want you to leave. We know that we're going to be as adamant as we are, please leave. We're going to be on your side to get you home as quick as we could. I know that may not seem that way, but it is our goal. Uh, for protection units, protection units were brought in from as far as away as the Kubis when they freed up a few to ship up this direction. So they've been scrambling for resources for sprinkle protection units and done the best they could to put that stuff on there. Um, the folks that want updated maps, uh, if you talk about the fire maps, one comes out every morning, every afternoon, depending on who's doing the maps. If you leave us your email address, we'll email you one of those maps and it sends the directors every morning or every afternoon. They'll be coming out later in the day, 
from last week or so, but prior you should get about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, getting about 2.30 in the afternoon. If you leave me your email address, we will email you one of these maps, because these folks are pretty busy, they do the best they can, but it's not always possible to have it. So if you're not getting it and you want a new fire map boundaries, give me your email address and we'll send it to you. So in 2010, when we had a problem at Thai Town, when I talked to a lady up there, she gave me a distribution list and this fire cut through. I fired up the 2010 email distribution list and we got them back online again. We send them the information every day that we can. So with that, I uh, will take questions when we're finished, but I'd like to thank you for your patience. I'd like to thank you for your understanding and for your time on a Friday night. Thank you. Thanks, Al. And uh, Dylan, would you like to come up as well? Electoral Area uh, Director for Area I. Thanks everyone for coming out. And I apologize, it's so cold in here. Uh, I don't control the uh, temperature. Um, so most of you have been to that are here have been to many of the meetings that uh, or the other meetings that I've already had. So you've already heard me speak about most of the other things related to CRD stuff. Um, so what I can tell you is that the CRD and, and myself have, have been in meetings with ministers, and we have brought up many of the issues that you have brought to us. So on Tuesday, I was in a meeting with Minister Rouse, and I did bring up the issue of insurance, and did bring up the issue of guides, and out guide operators, and trappers, and all of the other things that are affected by not just you know necessarily having your home burnt, but being in an ordered area. So whether that's not being able to get hay up, and, then, and the cost associated with that afterwards, and the cost is about having to think about getting rid of your herd. So those messages are getting to the government, they are getting to Victoria. I know the regional district just brought them up on Monday, I brought them up on Tuesday, we continue to ask for further meetings with ministers to bring these issues up again and again so that they are dealt with, so that they are hearing us. So these, these, the issues that you are sharing with us, please continue to share with them with us because we are passing them on. More powerful of everybody else here is also sending that message to Victoria and not just your uh, officials, because it's far more powerful if the actual people, if they hear from the actual people and not just your local representative. So bear, bear with everybody. They're doing their best to get you back into your homes. Um, I know it's been a long haul. So I know it's a hard thing to deal with. Everybody is, is trying to deal with it at the same time. Not all of us have been evacuated. As you heard, Al himself was evacuated, so he does understand what it's like to be evacuated. So please, please bear with these guys. I know it's difficult. We try to get this information out as fast as possible. Um, and we are here in what we're saying. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so now we'll, we'll open it up if you have any questions um, for the Durham Regional District and LA Oaks um, at the back there. So you're saying
for it. What we have suggested, normally we go to UBCM and uh, directors are asking, you know, we have to also get UBCM. Well, UBCM is being administered as uh, MLA Oaks, I'm going to call you a bit of a story. Mr. Oaks would have said it would be uh, speed dating in 50 minutes. We've already said to the government, that's not enough. We need them up here. The individual members, ministers in the community to talk to us about things we need to do. And we could talk about recovery, but the rural areas are devastated by this, and the word devastation is something I use all the time. We just did a media tour of Soda Creek uh, Road for folks. Um, I think the media was shocked at what they saw. And we intend to do that with ministers to show them what we are suffering in our region. And the people here, as MLA Oaks indicated, uh, we've taken resources out of these communities for decades, and it's time to money flow back to us to rebuild our economies and to get things going again. I always believe there's a silver cloud to every or silver line to every cloud. I think perhaps we can maybe turn this into a positive, but it's going to take us a long time. No, there was several hands up, I think. Uh, just turn it over here. I, I know some years back we, we had a new plan <coughs> brand new that where we looked at uh, how the caribou was going to be used and I think in this case um, what needs to happen is there needs to be a, an inquiry into into all the fires, you know, basically fires. And I think uh, my question would be to Corey Oaks. I know there's a lot of problems but there needs to be an inquiry. I think you should uh, Put, put together um, a resolution requesting an inquiry to go into a 2018 and so we can look at this whole question of fire. I, like I, 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 I know for a fact that the bands, the Tocoon bands, they said next year we're all going to go stay home and I think a lot of bands in BC are going to say that. You know. And I think that's one of the issues on the Indian point of view that needs to be looked at. And the other issues is like, like I sat in the command center at NASCO, you know, three, four days, having coffee, I listened to everybody, and there's, there seems to be a huge communication problem in the, among, among the forestry personnel, you know, from one guy picking his to where another person comes in, uh, uh, he doesn't know what's, what the last worker did, so I think uh, we'd have to look at that. And, and put down on detail on paper, uh, like uh, how it should run, like uh, how the command center should run. And, and I think, uh, on the question of permit side, uh, like we were out of this red area. We're way out of that area, and we have routes to Vanderhoof, we have back routes to Prince George, and routes to Cornell, and another route to Prince George. And my wife you know, has been gone in and out, you know, requesting for permit. And, um, Everywhere she goes, like that's when Nashville band, everyone tells her, no, you can't. And in this case, uh, like, uh, we have a small window, you know, to go in and make hay, and now, now, from here on, it, it's um, sunshine one day and rain, rain another day, that like, we've lost that window to make hay, and, you know, for, you know, for him, that's a setback of 10,000 bucks plus. And, and I think, you know, there's uh, issue communication problems with and fire crews, um, and forestry personnel, uh, they set up the pumps and then they ran. Uh, there was a very few people from NASCO that, that manned the pumps that like day and night just to keep them running and have the pumps never ran. So I think uh, we, we need to look at all these issues, you know, with this inquiry. So do you have a, did you say you had a question for Emily? Do you just want to ask her about the inquiry? I, I think uh, it would be good for Corey Oaks to develop this, yeah. this resolution requesting for an inquiry. And Roger, thank you. And, and you know, I, when we were here a couple of weeks ago, your comments, I, I took a lot of notes and um, I want to thank you for that. Um, I think that, you know, I was out the Big Lake too, and they talked about the exact same thing. And it's not as a I, I think that we're going to have future years of difficulty with fires. Um, and so the more that as a community that we're prepared and that we look at that, um, I was really, uh, I spent a lot of time when the Australian team was here, when Neil's team was here about how Australia handles interface. 
um, from a provincial scope, not just from a, a community by community. And I think that we need to be looking at that and we need to be building into plans like you said. Um, I'm not sure what the official language, I've never been through anything like this, but I'd be happy to work with you and, and um, look forward to, to your ideas. It would be a good exercise to do it with the Jury 2018, get all the ranchers in. And, uh, right now, uh, for the Indian, Indian communities, uh, I picked a lot, of, a lot of moose, lots of deer burned, and you know, a lot of food off the table. So, uh, you know, um, I think there's you know, some of the things we have, probably have to look at is close down the moose hunting. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's one of one of the suggestions. <coughs> I know some guy out there that might be against it, but uh, to tell you the truth, the last four or five years there has been no news. Uh, been very, very little. Okay. Thanks, sir, for all your comments, and, and definitely we uh, will be taking those those suggestions forward. I think the next question was at the back there. No, I agree with Roger. A lot, a lot of people in residents in my community too have said the same thing. They're not leaving. They get an order, they're staying in the other end because they've seen, they just said, you know, the way we were handled on this last evacuation part of the there was, there was no respect. And they said, it was pretty nice. We need to get, we need to stay to protect our, our place. Um, we did the next community meetings, everybody said that we need to put together maps and structure and um, sources to pump water to put fires out or survival fires in some ways so that we can stay. I, I totally agree with what Roger's saying. We've lost the window for a lot of game. Uh, I don't know. I have, I have did, did you have, sorry, sir, do, you have, do you have a specific question to add to that? Is there any help in putting, like, is there any financial help in getting these organized, these stations organized so we know where the supply, water supplies are, but expanding them to make them large enough? Yeah. Uh, I can, so one of the things that we've been doing is we've been going out to communities and Sage, I want to thank you for coordinating the one up, um, and helping uh, out at Barlow Creek, is how critically important it is to have volunteer fire departments um, in communities. And you can set them up in different fashion. So, for example, um, Big Lake is a volunteer fire department, and it's it's separate from um, uh, from a taxation perspective. McLeese Lake, for heaven's sake, started a couple of years ago with a ten thousand dollar truck. They used a, a water um, a, a cattle feeder heater to keep the water. Uh, like I, I mean, they've been innovative. I've got to tell you, the volunteer fire departments in the Caribou are the most some of the most innovative folks I've ever met. So why don't we look at how if you've got some type of uh, volunteer fire protection um, agencies in, in our pockets, in our communities, um, who once a year make sure that you're running different, where maybe you're, you've got a list of the maps of who are in your community and what types of response that you can have, um, I think are, is an important thing that we should be looking at. I can tell you that the communities that had um, those volunteer fire departments, especially in the first few days um, when they were doing the patrols and as we had those lightning strikes and everything like that, um, were incredibly valuable. And so you have my commitment that I'm going to continue to work on how we can get some funds um, for, for volunteer fire departments. What I would like to know is what is there for um, the availability of setting up uh, strategic water um, Pumping points on Crown Land, on Crown um, Crown Streams, or such. There's many strategic spots we can easily get in and out of. But what is there for? I guess the requirements is there allocate allowances for that for these types of things. I don't know if I'm a program for that, sir. Um, I do know that there's another way of getting water setting it up. Uh, accessing water and that uh, permits can be obtained and there's designs for you know what they call them a dry hydrant and put the put the, the pipe out into the lake or the water body and have a standpipe for one of a better word or a hydrant. It's dry hydrant, you have to put suction to it. 
Um, and there's those designs are all done, and you can get a permit from the Ministry of Environment to do that. So the community wanted to do something like that. Um, I know they do that. But we can help you find out where those permits are because we put those in for our for volunteer fire permits. They they have some too. Um, with respect to what you're talking about, maybe it's a, it's a mustard type station where there's nearly no water. Probably a good plan. I think going forward, some of these debriefing sessions we're talking about is to try and get some of these ideas on the table and work with our our folks at Forestry about how these can be set because it'd be beneficial to them too if they were identified as sources of good sources of water. Although well, they do know a pretty good idea. That was our plan was that if we had these out Well, if, I think you might be referring to like a dry hydrant system. And, and, and so there's a design. We don't need to build it. It's already designed. It's just a matter of planning and getting the purpose of having it installed. And strategically, it's okay in, them. in your community and places where the ministry would probably say it'd be useful to have one here, useful to have. It saves them some time in some cases. Not necessarily. You've got to remember a structural fire department versus fighting uh, a bushfire. A totally different training and a totally different vehicle is needed. I, I looked at a shiny fire truck that was delivered by U.S. Mister to the First Nation community in Chilcote, and you know, downtown Williams Lake Bay was a good tool. It's not necessarily a good tool for us up in Bush. It doesn't work very well. So, uh, I think, sorry, thanks for uh, your comments, and definitely we'll, have to, we'll take that going forward in these future debriefing sessions. Those are, like Elsa, the kinds of things we, we hope to come out of that. Um, just being respectful of time, I want to make sure we, we carry along. So, uh, just a couple more questions. Make sure that if you could just stick uh, straight to your question and we can get an answer as concise as possible so we can get to everyone. I think uh, this lady here, then this gentleman, and this gentleman, and, and then I think we, uh, we'll, we'll make sure to get the right cross in as well. So, I just like to say three things. First of all, appreciation to all the people who have been working so hard on this. Um, we're strained. We're not here to pick at anyone. I, I appreciate the work that's gone in by every person involved. Um, talking about utilizing local resources, in the 60s and the 70s, we had fire warden programs with local people activated to fight fire. That was removed years back, I know, because I was retired from that. Perhaps that's something we might consider reinstating to be able to take action when things are small. Fire wardens and their crews are not equipped to fight this type of fire that this team is working on. The, the local resource people can certainly assist. They are invaluable for information. Um, and, and on that point, I would like to ask, if there's any way that the local liaisons can be kept on. Because every day we are online, we are asking what's happening, what's happening. We're looking for little gems of information about home communities. And the teams that come in are doing a job and they're doing it to the best of their ability. As a consumer, I'm not always getting a newsletter that's giving me any new information. The last little while I was like, oh, this is the same hearing that you're dying for something new. But we are getting information through the underground from the local liaisons. And that is marvelous. And I think that that is really helpful because they know who place it was. They know how to communicate it to the people involved. So I would just request that we try to keep that parent in the fire too as part of the team. And thank you for your good words. Thanks. Um, so I think the next question is here. Actually, it's the same thing. We've been back and it's still standing, but I have to commend both the fire service and the CRD people for making uh, information and permits available uh, for us to be up there. Um, without that support, uh, it wouldn't be possible. And compared to 2010, the, the difference in improvement is spectacular. Um, it would be better now that, uh, because we're in the southeast section, since moving information officer to uh, the Ponce area, the, that information is not forthcoming in this region any longer, but um, that's the only complaint I have. But overall, the uh, whole information uh, process and permit process is 
fun flawlessly for us. So we commend you for that. Thank you. And fighting the fire. <laughs> so do it yourself. <coughs> And I think that this gentleman had a question as well. Can anybody on the panel outline what is the official line to uh, inform residents of losses of their property? Who's, who's actually in charge of that? Uh, you call them on our regional district office, call our public information line, uh, and we can put in touch with people that are assembling that information, and that's spreadsheet speaking of. So it's, it's my responsibility to call them? Well, uh, at, so here's what happens, I think, because we've done a few of them, I made some calls myself. Uh, the trouble is we will get a location, we'll get an address, it has an address that's very helpful. In some cases, it's a GPS location, we have to find another map, and we look at the, the registration on BC registration online, the registrations have something under, under title, and that doesn't provide us with much. It gives us a name, it gives us an address, and we have to go look for a phone number. That phone number is usually a landline associated with us, they don't have cell numbers and no email numbers. So if you're in an area and you have an address and we know what that address is, we can then confirm. It's really helpful that we, because once we have a location, we know who we can contact. So we had a huge issue in some places trying to get a hold of people. Um, and some, this may surprise you, some, some through Facebook, someone contacted me about somebody that went through about five different generations and finally we got a number per person that we could call them and inform them of their loss. So, it's really difficult because ours is all done by the BC assessment. So when we get that address, we get your assessment, that gives us the information about who owns the property. So if, if you want to know, uh, and we're going to give you the public information line, get the address and location, and we can log in when we start to look to see. Right now, uh, REMS has assembled a uh, list. Um, some of the areas in Chilcote were probably going to fly by helicopter and do GPS locations because it's too hot for us to get in. Yeah, we can't put people on the ground to ground truth it. Normally what we do is we go, we take pictures, and we actually ground truth the address. And, and to ensure we get, we don't misinform someone, but the hardest part is to phone someone that didn't lose their house. And actually, through all that work, that one phone call I made, I did call someone who didn't lose their house, but I was trying to get a hold of the person, their sister, their sister had, and they knew. But it's, they're very difficult calls to make, and we've had people making those calls. So um, if you think or you're concerned about your residents, um, we sometimes, we have a list of together, we, we have a whole spreadsheet of them, and then we go down the list and check on who was, was it not building, was it main structure. So call the Regional District Information Line. Forestry is sending us, or fire service is sending us that information, we, we're assembling it and putting it together. And then we have other organizations that are coming in to try and help people. Sometimes they'll even go through and sift through the ashes they, if you have lost a home to get some of your values out of the Samaritan's Purse is in Williams Lake right now. They've just completed 30 some odd tasks at Spoken Lake. They've done some self care of So that assistance will come in as part of the recovery. Um, there's other groups around this evening that are around trying to help people rebuild. So call our information line, give us the address, and we'll, we'll try to do that. So I guess my question is why is it so complicated? Why can't forestry, if they're, if they're aware that you've lost structures, why don't they just tell you? Why do I have to uh, wait for five? Wait, I have to go to Williams Lake to find out. I don't know why you have to go to But uh, Forestry gives us the information, and then we create the sheet, and then we try to contact people as quickly as we can. We want these guys to fight the fires, thank you. We, we'll do the, the background work, but we do have to ground trees that we have to go look at, and we don't want to misinform anybody. So it's taken a while for some reason as we plow through the number of losses. So, uh, so as the, if, the, if it's still under evacuation order, then you're not going to be able to get to a place to ground truth to find out exactly what was lost. Is that what you're saying? If it's safe enough for our people to go in as 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 entry limited to do that, they'll do it as quickly as they can. We're actually they're actually gonna uh, with some show code stuff it's not safe for them, so I say they're gonna fly it, they're gonna pinpoint it, we're gonna go back and try to assemble information based on GPS locations. It's gonna take a bit, but we can do it through mapping now. Our mapping is much superior than it was even in, in 2010. So we're able to locate things and get better addresses and Unless someone's hiding that sort of the bush that don't want to be found, then we can't call in people, we can't count for those. But for the most part, you'd be surprised that we know where structures are, and that way we can then pinpoint them, and then we can start to pull that information from BC assessment. That gives us a name, then we start looking for the name. So if you have an address that you think you have a loss, you should be able to call our, our, our line, and we will get back to you. What we're usually missing is it's tied to your home phone number. 
not to a cell number, not to an email address. So we probably have some suggestions for BC assessment as to how we might contact owners because the landline doesn't quite cut it anymore when you can evacuate your house and you're not there. Can I give you an idea on how to do that? Sure. I think most people that have evacuated probably have contacted uh, ESS and they have a definitive list of where people are at. And we, and we do do that and we have a bullet and it, as well as with the Red Cross. And then there, we come into the call, that called the Freedom of Privacy and Information. And so we come up against our own bureaucracy. But we do try. And so we do. Yeah, so, yeah. Just, like, just like all your, your, one of your employees said they don't do that. Well, we do. Yeah, oh, we, have, we, we have do. done that. And we've tried, we're trying to explore as many options as we can. Yeah. Can you tell me his name? Well, if you wanted to come up afterwards and you can uh, give me any addresses, I can write them down and follow up as we go back to the Emergency Operations Center. You can also call in our public info line. That's 1-866-759-4977. I can give you that number afterwards. You can uh, let us know your address and we can follow up with you. So. Um, I think we'll just uh, continue on and we just have uh, uh, the Red Crosses left. Um, just to touch on this, the, the services and projects as well, um, afterwards we have the RCMP here to answer any questions. So I'll let uh, Naomi go first and then RCMP. Thanks, Naomi. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'll try to be quick. I know we're nearing 7.30 and I can hear from you. It sounds like a lot of your hearts and minds are really on your homes right now, right? When can I get home and will it be okay and what's going on? Um, so I can't address any of that, but I can talk a little bit about some of the assistance a lot of it you'll know about already because some of you would have received it, some of you will be working hard to receive it and you'll know that we've been quite backed up and we've been working, um, as you've heard, it's certainly a, a big disaster that we've never seen the likes of in BC before spread out across the whole province. So certainly some things are going to take longer than we'd like and we're working with you to try to get funds as soon as possible. So most of you will know that um, everyone who is evacuated will receive $600. Um, that came from the BC government to the Red Cross to be distributed. So some of you have already received that and some are working with you to get that out. Also, you would have heard probably that people who are out for 14 days or longer will receive an additional $600. And that money, there was a bit of a backlog on that as we were working with the provincial government to make sure we have good data on who was out for how long. A lot of that is in place now, so things are moving a lot more quickly and you'll start seeing some of that when it's, when it's relevant. The other piece, um, we know that going back home has costs too. Often there's, you know, there's transportation, there's uh, repurchasing groceries and that kind of thing. So another $300 per household um, for re-entry. And now initially that re-entry funds, we are of course prioritizing people who were already going home, recognizing that they were incurring those costs right away. But now that we're starting to move through the backlog a little bit, that money is going out to everyone because we know everyone will be returning, able to return to their area at some point. So some of you might see that before you are actually able to go home. Just know that that's, those are the funds for when you are able to go home. And of course, the, the go ahead about the, the evacuation orders and alert. That. So I just want to mention, I hear people um, talking about some of their businesses and, and about wanting to do things to support their communities. Um, a couple of, there's some information on the back table, but there are a couple of um, resources. One is a small business grant program. So if you owned a small business, um, that might be a you know, ranching company, a guiding company, uh, you're a contractor that was licensed. Um, there are grants of $1,500, emergency relief grants that you can apply for, and the information is on the back table. That will probably be relevant to a lot of folks that are in this area. There's also what we're calling a community partnerships program for community organizations of a, a variety of kinds who are interested in putting together activities or projects to help the community recover and also to reduce the risk for future disasters, which I've heard some talk about. So please do take some information from the back and, and look into applying to some of those pieces as well. That's it for me. I'm happy to take questions. And if anyone has specific questions about your case or your funds, we can talk about that in the back after we'll be around for a little while. Yeah. I have two questions. Okay. One is, and I'm, I'm assuming that you're already aware of this, but we had a problem that happened this afternoon that almost everyone in the Nazca community got an email saying that you're returning home and here's, you're going to be receiving your $300 for returning home. If you choose to receive this money, that's an acknowledgement that you will no longer be needing any assistance. Um, I'm working at the fire camp. The problem that we saw immediately was a, if, if people were going, felt that they were going to get cut off because we are not yet home and don't see the future yet at going home. But the, the, the safety issue was people had the assumption, wow, we get to go home. 
Ryan addressed earlier, is that if you do accept the $300 for reentry, that absolutely doesn't mean that you won't still receive all those other funds that you're eligible for. So we'll certainly have our communications folks look really carefully at that wording, recognizing how distressing that can be for people to feel like they have to make a choice. Um, but definitely eligible for those other pieces that I mentioned earlier, in addition to the $300, whenever you do receive that. Um, and direction on when you can return home certainly doesn't come from the Red Cross, but from the local authorities. So we'll try to make sure that's much more clear going forward, absolutely. So Number two, yes. Second question. Um, I, I have not been able to directly access the Red Cross except for online because I'm working at, at Fire Camp. Yeah. I'm sure there are other people that are struggling to make the connection. I know there have been days that the Red Cross has been present here in the EVAC Center. When I came down this week to say, when are they next here? Um, they didn't know. And when I called the Red Cross number, I was told they will not be returning to Quinnell. And so I have, and, and, and the request that I had, I was told you have to go to Prince George or to William Blake, which is impossible for me. I'm sure it's not just about me, but I'm sure that other people are having the same struggle. We can't drive all the way to Prince George or William Blake. By the time you do that, you've used up whatever funds you were hoping yeah, totally, yeah. And so we were in Williams Lake. Um, part of it depends on capacity and how many volunteers we have. But definitely, we were, in, or sorry, if you're in Quenelle, a couple of times in a row as we were working on some specific cases, getting some funds out to some specific people that we knew needed them. And definitely, we will be back. We're working right now on trying um, to kind of come up with an, an outreach strategy for around the whole province to make sure that we're really systematic and that we can communicate to our, our contact center, which is the number that, that you guys all have to call for information, so that they will know when we will be and when. Because we're working, we're kind of making a lot of the decisions locally, and we're trying to work with um, the folks on the ground to decide when would be a good time. It's, it's not always done very far in advance, but we're working on them making that much more clear and much more kind of cut and dry in a calendar so that everyone has access to that information. So we'll definitely be in Twinell regularly going forward, and we'll also be in the area um, for a long time. Our, our main operation, of course, is kind of in Williams Lake right now, and we're kind of settling in there to be probably a year, at least, in that area with the presence around here, for sure. So I'm also wondering, is there any way that those of us who cannot come into a center on the specific day that there happens to be someone in the building, um, I was told that we, other than registration, we cannot access Yeah, no, so there's, I mean, we're moving again toward the system where we're having more of what we're calling the casework, which is kind of talking through your specific situation and seeing which pieces you're eligible for. More of that happening remotely, so over the phone. So again, you'll start to see more and more of that as we work through some of the backlog and other issues and have a bit more capacity to, to do that reach out to people. So definitely coming in the next little while, as well as probably calls to a lot of you saying, okay, we've got some funds that are available for you now. It's, you know, it's, we're working through the processes. Um, and are you able to come into one of our centers? If not, we're going to take your information and let you know um, when we'll be in your area. So all that's will be happening. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, my understanding is on, I think it was uh, Saturday, the Red Cross was here for a few hours. There was uh, a lot of people that did not know that. Yeah. yeah, so that's the same point as we mentioned earlier that um, in some cases, it was working with specific people that we knew had kind of backlogs, and so trying to work through those, those um, we're calling them escalations, but kind of to get some of the money out to people that we know are, are lacking it and needing it. But definitely going forward, it will be um, more probably on a more regular basis and advertising more broadly as we're working throughout the whole province on figuring out which sites we're going to be in and uh, setting up a really clear calendar for the next little while going forward. Um, I don't have information on that yet. We're just working on the strategy right now. Certainly, it'll be shared out through the EOCs to share out through their channels, um, probably on Red Cross Facebook as well, and then through all of our contact centers that are the way that we're in touch with the public. But more to come on that. Yeah. Any other last questions for the Red Cross? All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, and then I'll just invite uh, Staff Sergeant Andrew Burton to come up, and, and if anyone has any specific questions or anything. Just introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of people here. I was part of the evacuation uh, team that was out in NASCO, uh, I'm not even 
which how many days ago that was, this all running together. Uh, my name is Andrew Burton, and I'm the, the detachment commander here in, in Cornell. Um, I don't have a, a set presentation uh, to, to give. Uh, as I look around the room, I see people that, uh, that I, I visited and, and knocked on doors, and, and I know uh, uh, there's been talk uh, of, of how difficult it is uh, to phone people after their homes have been, have been destroyed, and, and I can tell you that while not on that magazine, it's very difficult to go to, uh, to people and uh, to tell them they have to leave if there's an evacuation order in, uh, in effect. And, and that's not easy for, for our guys. And, and looking at, at the faces of the people that we're speaking with and, and, and sensing that people wanted answers that we just didn't have was a really difficult thing for, for myself as well as uh, for, for the people on my team. And, and I heard a comment earlier, and I believe it was you, sir, uh, that you felt you were disrespected by, uh, by some of the Okay, and, and perhaps I would like to catch you before you go, if I can, just to talk about that. Um, as I said, I don't have any, any real presentations or, or anything specific to say. Uh, I, I certainly want to thank um, Shannon in the back. You were uh, absolutely fantastic to deal with as a community liaison. We couldn't have asked for a better uh, partner. Uh, we had lots of official stakeholders sitting at the table here, but the way that you stepped up and, and the way the nation stepped up during that time was absolutely fantastic, and I want to say thank you very much. If I could ask for a round of applause, I would. I admire your team, and uh, absolutely fantastic, and, and uh, very pleased that we were able to form that type of uh, relationship. So thank you very much for that. To me, with regards to policing and public safety, I'm not going to be able to tell you when the fire is going to be out. I'm not going to be able to tell you when you're going to be able to go home, and I'm not going to be able to tell you where the next road check's going to be, or how many people are on it, or things like that. Uh, but if you have questions about safety and security in the evacuated areas, I'm your guy. Any questions? For those that have stayed behind in an evacuation area, uh, whether it be on permanent or they just said forget it and not leaving, some don't have homes, but they travel between properties to do not look after animals or do not miss this check on neighbors. What about getting? Having them, I mean, they've been told they'll just stay home. But what about having them help with the security? Most of those people that have stayed know the residents in the area know vehicles, and they know when there's a strange vehicle in the area. Yeah, did everyone hear that? And I need to repeat it. Did everyone get that? It was basically about the people who have chosen to remain in, uh, behind an evacuation order area. Is it possible to have uh, give them some sort of authority or put them to work, essentially, um, in, in being the eyes and ears for the police? And I think, you know what, to a certain extent, we have we rely on people like that. But there's a huge liability. The, the evacuation order doesn't say, well, except for you, you, you. It says everybody must go. And if you stay, that's that's your choice. We're not going to drag you out by the eyelids. I promise you that. But it's hard for us to say, you must go, but if you stay, can you help do my work for me? That's just not a practical solution. I like the way that you're thinking, and I, and I think, you know, one of the things that we always, we, we have to worry about is, for me, cut and dry, it would be nice if everybody left. Then I know there's nobody but a firefighter behind the line. And when stuff goes missing, I know, well, I know there's, there's registry. And I know that's not uh, not going to happen. So, and I know that's one thing that you guys, yeah, but I'm a good guy, and I'm looking after my neighbor's boat or, or whatever. And there's been some really fantastic people that have stepped up. Uh, we get that. I know you, you alluded earlier to one of the things was, you know, uh, uh, people are required to to stay. If you're staying, you got to stay on your own spot. It's really not okay, quote unquote, to be going over and looking after someone's horses or or, or cattle or or their generator or whatever. Um, because then they're not on their own property, we don't have an accounting. It's, it comes down to, to safety as well as liability. For safety's sake, if the fire starts to run, we need to know who's in that area, where boats they are, so in case we have the opportunity to send the first responder in, we need to know where they're going to be. So it's not practical to say, well, stay on your farm and go look after your, 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 your neighbors. We recognize that that's going to happen, but understand from, from the policing point of view and from the public safety point of view, it's, it's not advantageous for us to not know where people are. That's not a big brother watching thing. That's a, 
everybody's safety sort of thing. And I hope that you, you kind of get that. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I understand that it's, my parents have been, this is probably, I think, a certain evacuation order that they've been through. They, they do have to travel between properties, look out, check on them and stuff. And yeah. There's some neighbors out there that they check on and don't have. Absolutely. And one of the things that we've spoken with to people is we have, I don't think it's any secret here, I'm not uh, uh, breaking any laws by telling you this, we've got the two checkpoints set up and we have what we call roping units in between. And people said, well, Andrew, I'm staying and I'm going to be looking after uh, Bill's boats and uh, that's all there is to it. And we've said, that's absolutely fine. But know that if you're stopped seven times in that seven kilometer stretch between your house and Bill's house, we don't don't grease out my guys for doing their job either, right? So we have to be able to work together on it. It's, it's a unique situation, and I think that there's been some some real uh, exemplary cooperation shown between uh, between everybody here. I think we're all here. We all care, and uh, I think that uh, we recognize the fact that it's not practical to stay inside your house if you choose to stay, but. You also need to recognize that we're going to be checking if you're out and about, and I think you can appreciate that. I think you, you, that that's a good thing. Yeah. Excellent. Was there other questions with uh, with regards to security? We were told by the uh, previous uh, information officer in the fire center in Asco that properties would be checked on at least every second day by the RCMP. Is that in fact the case? Uh, for the most part, yes, and we can't dedicate resources specifically, as you can imagine, the situation is quite dynamic with the, the entire area of Quinell, the area that's under uh, alert, the Quinell Catholic area that's under alert evacuation is quite significant. It's, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of square kilometers. Uh, we are doing our best to, to get out and to, to check on, on, uh, on communities. And uh, NASCO is set, certainly no exception. Thai Town, no exception. The First Nations community, no exception. The minute that Kluskis opened up, we had people into that community. Uh, so uh, is it every second day? I can't give you that guarantee, but I can tell you that we have uh, we have people in there very, very frequently. Which again brings to the point why, uh, if there's nobody there, it makes our job of checking up real easy, because there's nobody there. And who decides where checkpoints go? That study in conjunction uh, recommendations with the RCMP, the Wildfire Service, and the CRD has the ultimate decision on where they're going to go. And that's based on where the, uh, the actual zone is, right? The, we don't want to be keeping people out of zone uh, areas that are not under uh, an evacuation order. So it's, it's, we move them fairly frequently, but that's always done in conjunction with the CRD.